uh, and cockroaches. Otherwise, they'll be very unhappy. But this intense biodiversity um, is amazing for scientists. It has led uh, many people to come here trying to find out all of the secrets that Costa Rica holds. Uh, for example, there's an American scientist named Dan Jansen who's been working in the same national park for over 50 years now, and the guy still discovers a new species of insect almost every day. There are that many bugs here. Uh, so great again if you like bugs. If you don't, it is terrible. Uh, and that's even like for some of the locals, right? It came in the other day. My phone's ringing off the hook. So I pick it up and this woman is like, bug lady, there's a tarantula in my washing machine. It's like, no problem. I'll mobilize the team. Just kidding. There's no funding for that. I walked up the hill and uh, got there, opened the washing machine, and was like, well, that's gross. Not at all because of the tarantula. She hadn't taken out the dirty laundry. So <laughs> then I ruined through somebody else's delicates trying to find a really stressed out tarantula. It's uh, not her natural habitat. Uh, and they're incredibly fragile. So she was really worried that if she fell, she would rupture her abdomen uh, because nothing ruins your day like your butt exploding. <laughs> and so I had to be very delicate and very gentle trying to get each little leg out. But if you know the inside washing machine barrel, thousands of tiny holes, a tarantula, 100% legs. And so every leg is through a different hole in the washing machine barrel. She's holding on for dear life. I'm breathing all over her, so she's freaking out. She's like, please don't eat me. And I was like, it's okay, I already had breakfast. And she was like, I don't believe you. So as soon as I got her back legs unhooked, she just started breaking them against her abdomen and then proceeded to flick all of her butt hairs directly into my face, which is nature's rudest defensive mechanism. I mean, who does that? Who chucks butt hairs? Uh, tarantulas. All of them, that like all of the tarantulas from the New World, that's their only defensive mechanism. That's all they've got. Uh, and so really, you end up with a very strange story to tell at dinner that night. Uh, but you'll absolutely survive. Uh, it just always ends in my husband being like, why are we talking about butt hairs at the dinner table again? <laughs> they don't bite? No, nope. I've never had one even try and bite me, and I've handled thousands of wild tarantulas. Their venom is used for eating. They can't digest their food. Uh, they can't masticate their food, rather. They have no chewing mouth parts, so they have to use their fangs um, to inject that venom to make a nice, delicious cricket smoothie. I assume it's delicious. I've never tried one. Uh, but they're going to use that venom to liquefy their food. So if they use it as a defense, they can't eat later. And so I've never even had one try to bite me. Uh, if they did, luckily our body is so significantly different than that of an insect that there would really be no repercussions. So you could get like two little kind of like bee stings or mosquito bites next to each other in the fangs. Uh, but they are significantly less dangerous than say a kitten. Uh, a, a kitten, a house cat, they kill 10 Americans a year. Tarantulas have never killed a human in the history of humans. So while you're afraid of tarantulas, it's entirely possible you're currently harboring a spiky fur ball of death <laughs> inside your own home. And you went on vacation abandoning it, so obviously it's been plotting your death this entire time. <laughs> At the very least, it pukes on your comforter, because that's just what cats do. They're awful. Uh, but meanwhile, tarantulas, like little pom-poms of love, uh, they are completely safe, have never caused a death, as long as you don't count a heart attack or falling yeah, off a cliff. But <laughs> wasn't the tarantula's fault. Uh, the reason we get so scared of tarantulas is because we all watch James Bond totally lose it. And when that dude is scared of something, you want it on your list of creatures to avoid. Uh, but it's completely unfair because they're not at all dangerous animals. Really boring lives. Normally that tarantula would have spent an entire 20 years of her life, very long lived, living in a little burrow underneath the ground, doesn't go anywhere. You can identify female tarantulas really easily. It's just like female humans. We've got bigger butts. That's because we have the babies. At least that's what I tell myself. But she lives 20 years in a burrow, never goes 
anywhere. Meanwhile, you've got your male tarantulas who only live five years. So they spend their whole time, day and night, running around looking for ladies. It's like that first year of college, they just never got over it. <laughs> so they are out on the prowl all the time. And they actually fall victim quite frequently to what's called a tarantula hawk wasp. So there are these big, giant, two to three inch black and orange wasps flying around hunting tarantulas. Yeah, uh, they're huge, huge, giant wasps. Uh, and when they find a tarantula, they'll attack it. They'll sting it. And they'll take that paralyzed tarantula and drag it sometimes as far as a kilometer to her secret lair. Uh, why? Because she has the world's pickiest kids. And I'm sure some of you are like, no, that was mine or my grandkid. But we're not just talking about Cheerios and plain cheese pizza here. This kid will only eat the living organs of a paralyzed tarantula. What's a mom to do? <laughs> and so she's going to fight a tarantula to sting it in the perfect place for every single baby she wants to have. And so she takes this paralyzed tarantula, lays an egg on top of it, it hatches, burrows into that tarantula, and that baby wasp spends the next two weeks reenacting aliens in real life perfectly. Making sure to save the organs for last, because who wants to eat rotting tarantulas? And then eventually, out erupts this giant wasp to start the whole cycle again. And uh, definitely one you want to avoid if you get stung, don't worry. You're not going to create the world's largest wasp. Though that would be kind of cool, as long as it wasn't happening to me. It would make picnics much more thrilling if every now and then you were like, get in the car! <laughs> yep, we'll continue with our mundane lives. Um, and so, these giant wasps, if they do sting you, however, you're looking at about eight hours of excruciating pain. Oh. So I hear... I've never been stung. Really easy to avoid. Don't touch the giant black and orange wasp. And you'd think that would be intuitive, right? But apparently not for Justin Schmidt. Dr. Justin Schmidt is an entomologist from the University of Arizona who goes around getting stung by all the ants, wasps, and bees that he can find. He is crazy even amongst entomologists, and we tend to set our bar pretty high. <laughs> but he gets stung by something, he rates it on a pain scale of one to four, and then pairs it with a description. So for that one, he said it was four out of four, shockingly electric, like dropping a running hair dryer in your bubble bath. Um, and who knows, maybe he's done that too. <laughs> he's crazy. <laughs> but it is definitely not the sting you want to experience um, while you're here in Costa Rica. Some other ones can be a little harder to avoid. My most common are from army ants, just because I really like birding. Oh, yeah, looking for birds. Whenever you hit a sweet pocket like today, I was up here in all these different bird calls, so I'd wander up above one of the greenhouses, and then all of a sudden, like, oh! in an ant swarm. And then there's ants in your pants. It's very embarrassing when you don't know the people you're birding with that well. Uh, but my husband, has it way worse. He is like a magnet for scorpion stings. The guy gets tagged all the time, at least once a month. Rolled over in bed the other day, found out he had been cuddling a scorpion and she did not consent. Um, he pulled on his pants about two months ago, goes downstairs, pours himself a cup of coffee, sits down at the table and boom, got up so fast. I'd never seen the poor guy dance so well before, but it turned out in the middle of the night, this pregnant scorpion waddles into his pants and is like, all right, this is where I'm gonna settle down and have my babies. <laughs> and then next thing the poor lady knows, there's an earthquake and she's getting crushed to death by a giant butt cheek. And the only way she has to communicate that these are her pants now is with her stinger. And it was an incredibly effective communication. I had never seen him drop his drawers that fast. <laughs> he was out of them. And once again, I was left trying to get an arachnid out of an awkward place. But um, I managed to get it out. 
It's a stinger it leaves in. Yeah, you know, it doesn't leave it in. Uh, she can sting multiple times, so she actually stung him twice. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I set her up. But again, totally fair, right? This is a life or death situation, and that's the only time a scorpion's going to use her venom because, again, she normally uses it to help her get her food, which is why we don't have any deadly species here in Costa Rica. You're in way more trouble in Texas and Arizona than you are in Costa Rica because we have so many bugs. A scorpion can try and catch a bug and miss or like sting it and it doesn't quite die and escapes. It's okay, there's another bug coming right behind it. If you're in the deserts of Arizona, you may only get one shot. So you need to have a super strong venom that's gonna lay that bug down immediately so you can eat it. So you tend in arid areas to find really dangerous species of scorpions, not here in the tropics as much, which is nice. <laughs> At least, although it totally ruins my plans to get rid of my husband. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know where that scorpion came from. <laughs> um, but these scorpions all over the place. Um, and so she did give birth. And scorpions give birth to about 60 tiny babies at a time. A little vent opens up and all these tiny babies, the species of centroides that we have here, have huge giant amounts of babies. I've counted as many as 45 to 50. And so they're all coming out and they're clamoring up her legs as fast as they can. They've got to get onto her back. Because when you're a teeny tiny little scorpion, there are so many predators. And the first predator you have to get past is your mom. Because when you have 60 kids at once, <laughs> laying down the law is the first priority. <laughs> and so she's just going to go ahead and snack on anybody who doesn't quite behave the way she wanted them to. Oh and God. so from 50 or so, she'll windle that down to about 30. And they'll all be sitting on her back. Oh, can you imagine labor for 50 kids? you got to be hungry at the end of that. Uh, and so they're all sitting up there. And nobody's moving. <laughs> and they're going to sit was very still for about three weeks until they've molted their exoskeletons twice. And they're a little bit thinner at this point because they've been feeding off an internal yolk source and now they're gonna scamper off into the woods and hope to survive. Except that all of those at the start 50 babies, one will reach adulthood. Wow. Which doesn't sound like good odds, but you're happy for that. Because if more survived, we would have exponential scorpion growth. And that would make everyone uncomfortable, especially my husband. Uh, but with all of these scorpions, you only want one to survive. So there's all these different pressures and predators that are put on a species to help make sure that not too many make it. You want to make sure that every individual just reproduces themselves so that you have a stable population. When you get too many, you have to start fighting for resources and things get tricky, like we're seeing with humans right now. <laughs> and so usually you have all these different pressures and predators to help keep a stable population. And with scorpions, it goes right to the very last second. Because these poor guys, the one adult male who made it to sexual maturity, you'd think at least that guy would be like, phew, in the clear. <laughs> but no. Because if your mom was willing to eat you, your girlfriend has no problem <laughs> at all. <laughs> and so even dating is incredibly stressful in the scorpion world. You're not heading over looking to see if she's cute. You want to see if she ate recently because that variable may determine whether or not you survive this next encounter. Uh, but he's got a few tricks he can throw out there. You can always try and woo ladies from afar. Uh, same way you would woo a human with a well choreographed dance routine. <laughs> and so before he's too close, his little pincers are over his head and his tail's curled up and he's shimmying over <laughs> to this female. And when we watch, it looks much more like he's having a tiny seizure. <laughs> but I guess to her, she's just like, whoo, what moves? <laughs> so as long as he's good enough at dancing, she'll let him get close enough where they actually grab pincers and he'll start dancing her across the floor and it really looks sweet like they're dancing. 
But even 350 million years ago, boys were not dancing for no reason. <laughs> so actually, he's laid a sperm packet down on the ground, and he's shuffling her over that. <laughs> and it's not nearly as romantic as it seems, which we ladies know is all too often the case. <laughs> but we're on to you, gentlemen. We're on to you. 